one sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind the light he could not see he clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows then jesus came and bade his darkness flee it's time to open the word once again with evangelist lester roloff on the family altar program for all is changed when jesus comes to stay all right turn your bible now please to the book of uh, second chronicles i want to remind some of you that maybe not acquainted with some of the passages in these uh, uh, genealogy books of some very precious truths in Second Chronicles chapter 18 and chapter 19 and 20. I'm going to choose some verses from these great chapters. Now, in, in the book of uh, Second Chronicles chapter 18, there was a wicked man. He was a king. His name was Ahab. And he made an appeal to a man that was a godly man. His name was Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat knew better than to line up with a wicked man like that. You know, evil communications corrupt good manners. And we've got a lot of people today that are in trouble. You girls and boys and men and women across this country, you get to running with the wrong crowd. And first thing you know, I talked to a daddy this morning on the phone, and uh, he said, Brother Wolf, I've given up. He said he's got to go to penitentiary. He's just in his teens. He said he's in so much trouble. And he said, uh, I, I wouldn't dare get the district attorney upset because he said uh, they've already turned a man loose that hired somebody to kill a man. They gave him seven years probation and said the district attorney thought sure he'd put him in the pen, but and somehow or another the thing stacked up and got crossed up. And this man who hired somebody and was proved to kill another man and they let him out on, and he said, uh, my boy could easily get 10 years. And said, no, I think I'm just going to wait and settle for two years in the pen. And so they promised that they thought they'd just give him two years. So I told him, just go on and get it over with. I said, I want to remind you of one thing. Your boy's a dope addict, and the penitentiary is not going to cure him. It'll never cure him. He'll come out of that dope addict. And you're going to have to do something for him when he gets through serving his sentence. When he gets through accepting the punishment, uh, that no doubt he is due to do because you're on probation. And I wish I could warn people to get on probation. That's your last chance. That's your last chance. Only the mercy of the judge. And he doesn't have any right, actually, to exercise any more mercy after you get on probation because he said, I won't tell you right now. I've heard him tell him, son, I won't tell you this is your last chance. And if you violate, if I catch you in a beer joint, if I catch you drinking liquor, or if you step out of line, or if you get outside the state, or if you do so-and-so, if you break your, this, you're, you're going right on without any trial. But, you see, people who do not know Christ are helpless to do the right. I mean, they cannot do the right, though they might know what the right is. But here comes a man along with the name of Ahab. He's a wicked king. In fact, he's one of the wickedest, and he had the wickedest wife of anybody ever lived. I mean, Jezebel was one more, I mean, wicked woman. And the Bible said she stirred old Ahab up to work wickedness. And, and so she's a bad influence on him. And uh, now then, Ahab comes along and said... Uh, to Jehoshaphat, verse 3, uh, he said, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? He answered, I am as thou art. <laughs> I'm just like you are. I'll be one, I'll be just like you are. My people is thy people. We'll be with thee in the war. That's what we're going to do. Now, the fat's going to hit the fire before I get through this message. And you know that everybody's getting tangled up with the world, thinking they're going to get along, and they're going to get along with the world, and we're going to be like the world to win the world, Brother Raymond. That's a lie. That's of the devil. And uh, I want to make it real plain today and offer no apologies. This is the truth, and it needs to be preached. Now, that <clears throat> you know what happened, don't you? Ahab, he was a coward. He said to Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat ought to know him better. He said to Jehoshaphat, he said, tell you what, I'm not going to wear my kingly robes and garments because he said they'd know me. He said, you go ahead and put on your robes. In other words, I want you to look like a king, but I don't want to look like a king. He said, I sure don't want to recognize me because I'm scared somebody kill me. And Jehoshaphat was silly enough to go into that thing, see? So Jehoshaphat, he just kept on his royal robes, and I guess he rode in the royal chariot and everything, and the people got after him, and they was about to kill him. They recognized, said, that's not Ahab. 
That's Jehoshaphat. So they took off after Ahab, and they got old Ahab. Brother, God always gets his man. Did you know that? You're not going to get by with it. God's going to get you. He'll get you. You, you might think you're a little smart, Ellie. He'll get you. You might think you're pulling everybody's leg around you. You're not getting by with it. I mean, God knows. He knows all about it. I mean, he's got your name and number and character written up in his book. He knows where you live. He's got you on his radar screen. He knows all your secret thoughts. So don't try to fool God now. You're getting more trouble than you are. And that goes for all of our grown people out there too. You can run a front just so long, but you won't get by with it. You can't cover up. And uh, so, uh, you know what happened to, to Ahab? He got killed. Verse uh, 34, 18th chapter. And the battle increased that day, how but the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. And about the time of the going down, of the sun going down, he died. I mean, that's sundown for him. I mean, that's all. I mean, he's through now. Oh, wicked Ahab. God told him. See? Of course, if you were to read the rest of it, a preacher came to visit Ahab one day and told him, he said, the blood, the, the dogs are going to lick your blood in the streets of Jezreel because you killed Naboth. Wonderful Jew. Wonderful. You killed Naboth and his little boys and took his vineyard away from him. And uh, the, the, in the place where you killed Naboth, the dogs are going to lick your blood in the streets of Jezreel. Now, I guarantee you, his carrot... His carriage went into Jezreel and the blood was running out of the carriage and looked out after a while in the old hungry dogs. Some more of the dogs, Brother Brad, you were talking about a while ago. They're licking up his blood. I mean, they're drinking king's blood. God's going to always get his man. But I'm not through there. Let's go to the 19th chapter. We got a rebuke for old brother Jehoshaphat coming up. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. He got out of it. See, God protected Jehoshaphat, even though he made a mistake. Now, Jehu, Jehu, he's that reckless driver, you know. He was that hot rodder. <laughs> uh, reminded me of this bunch of uh, little kitty cars up here now. Sunday. Boy, they're up there thick as flies around a garbage can. Up there racing on Sunday morning. That's of the devil. Boy, this old nation sure has lost its respect for God. I can remember the time when if they'd have pulled something like that, they'd have been thrown in jail or run out of the community. But now then, see, the Lord's day means nothing anymore. And one of the reasons is because our preachers haven't preached the holiness of the Lord's day. We haven't practiced it. We've gone crazy running away from the Lord's day. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Is that what you're going to do? Shouldst thou, shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Is that what you're going to do? Jehoshaphat said he'd gone over there to try to help out a heathen king. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now then, will you turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll read verse... 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, what did he say? He said we're not to be unequally yoked together with who? unbelievers. There's not a believer here that ought to be yoked up with an unbeliever. You can't get yoked with an unbeliever without paying the price. And so I want to speak today on separation from the world. I want to give you some things, first of all. Uh, number one, I notice a long article, and this has to do with my denomination, uh, though I sometimes feel I'm pretty loosely attached. 
and I have completely renunciated all forms of organized religion. I have no confidence in it, but I'm for Christ, and I'm for the Bible, and I'm for the local church that preaches the gospel and gets people saved. I make no denomination an issue. I just simply preach Christ and want to help people, and we've got people here that are Catholics, Mormons, and other things that come in and various forms of religion, but I don't have any confidence in any of that as such, but I do have my confidence in Jesus. I never dreamed that my denomination that I was so loyal to for so long would so quickly get away from Christ. Now here, and this has to do with the scripture that I've read, Baptist broadcasts bridge age gaps and span the world. Now I want to show you what an otherwise fundamental, Bible-believing, grace-preaching denomination at least used to do. I want to show you what they're doing now. This is the television and the radio deal that's set up. Our goal is to have the greatest possible impact on the quality of life in our nation and around the world, and that means gaining attention of the largest possible number of people. Now, that's where we get in trouble. We've got to gain the attention of the people. Don't make any of what we do to do it. We've got to gain the attention. Let's read on. To achieve this, we must produce programs that people can enjoy regardless of racial, religious, or cultural background and programs that broadcasters everywhere will accept and put on the air, this dear leader said. We've got to fix something the world can enjoy. There's our danger today. Let me read on. I'll show you where we've gone. Now, as a result, they got $5 million worth of radio time given to them. And let me tell you something. When the television bunch begins to give you a batch of time, I'll guarantee you what you're putting on ain't worth looking at. That's the worldliest crowd in this country today because it's a show crowd. Now then, they said we spent 1500000 that's a million and a half, I mean just producing and paying salaries and so forth. Now I want to show you what we're going to have to do, he said. Updating of the commission's programs is noted even in the Baptist hour. And the Baptist hour has always been a preaching hour. I mean, there have been much good, many good sermons, some of the finest preachers. But I want you to notice the trend now. And this has to do with the very scriptures I've been reading this morning. He said the Baptist hour, which is only, which it's, it's only real preaching broadcast, the only one. None of the television programs are preaching broadcast or telecast, none of them. They don't allow preaching on television. They don't want preaching on television. And they've so stated, more of the half hour production is being devoted to music, all right being devoted to music, some of which is done in new arrangements with a contemporary sound. You know what that means, don't you? That means Beagle style and Beatles style and Barking style and Yelping style. And that means uh, the hippie style. We're going to change the style of it, you see. I, I never dreamed of that. I, old brother Ike Reynolds would just come out of the grave if he knew that Baptists were singing some of the junk they're singing today. Amen. I'll tell you, why, he, listen, uh, he said, talking about this Dr. So-and-so, pastor of a certain city, and featured speaker on the broadcast, is giving, listen to me, shorter gospel messages with content listeners can easily relate to modernly. He's cutting down on his gospel messages. I believe we need to extend them. I believe we need to lengthen them a little bit. But you see, shorter and shorter will be the gospel messages. Don't preach unto us hard things. Preach unto us smooth things. All right, other programs developed by the commission, and this is the denomination, a rock music radio program for teenagers, which is in its first year and is heard on stations across the country. The program uses popular rock songs as an entree for comments on living life in the contemporary world as a Christian. In other words, we gain their attention with rock and roll, which is of the devil and sin. Here's another one featuring the best in the country music. Leading country western entertainers give their views of life and testimony concerning the church and the values it teaches. Leading western singers 
and having a Western program, not a spiritual program at all. Another one, one of the most popular programs is heard over in the United States and in foreign countries. It's an entertainment program combining popular music and interviews with celebrities and people in the news. Nothing spiritual, no gospel preached. Nobody will ever get saved. Dear friends, I feel the church needs to sponsor that which is evangelistic and that will get people under conviction and get them saved. Then this little jive business they put out, tell it like it is. I believe in doing that, but we ought to tell it like the Bible is. We ought to tell a sinner what he is without Christ. I believe in telling it like it is, but I don't believe in telling it in the terminology of the world and in the slang of the world. Notice, this is the last thing I want to say. We must take a 20th century approach, I'm quoting. We must take a 20th century approach to radio that will appeal to people who would change stations on or switch off the station if they heard another sermon coming, but who might sit back and listen for five out of 25 minutes to the gospel message at the end of a fascinating program. Now, you listen to me. That's exactly what I've been reading about in the Bible. We think that we can just kindly throw God in the trunk like we would a spare tire. And if we ever happen to need we get him. They said, we'll have an entertaining program and we'll tack about five minutes of some little gospel message or devotional on the end of it. God's not pleased with that Tommy Rod. I tell you, God's gospel is not going to play second fiddle to nothing in this world. You make up your mind. And I'm going to say to my radio friends right now and to all of our people, you're in for the same old gospel I've been preaching for no plan to let up but bear down a little heavy and a little harder all the time. And I'm going to preach just like I've been preaching because God's blessed it. And you're going to find that that old dog that they've been hunting with won't hunt. That old horse will balk when they need to pull a load. You wait and see, brother. When we get into the valley and when we, and we're approaching the pre-tribulation times now, if not already in them, and they're going to need something besides a bunch of silly entertainment today. We'll never reach the world by living like the world. I've got something else I want to share with you. Brought one of my old Bibles along. Here it is. I was in Dr. White's home many years ago. Dr. Billy White, Dr. W.R. White, president of Baylor University. I used to go in his home once a year when I'd go speak at Baylor. That's been many years ago. And I'd go in his home. He said one day to his associate, the vice president, Guy Newman, and uh, he said, Guy, I want you to go upstairs and I want you to get an article and give it to Lester. And I was at that beautifully spread table and we were having some sweet fellowship. Mrs. White, great Bible teacher, premillennial Bible teacher, had been uh, making some pleas and comments and so forth. He brought this article down to me, and I want to show you what it says. But I want you to read it, Lester, and see how far we've gone. Years ago, I'm reading, years ago, in 1926 to be exact, I said in a letter to Brother T.T. T. Martin, the real peril of our situation our soundest leaders do not see. Our seminary is a large and illustrious past and a world reputation for soundness and orthodoxy it's loved and trusted by its thousands of graduates and former students. Its children love and trust a mother. The next generation of faculty is going to see men of higher degrees from still higher institutions of learning, men of polished personalities and winsome ways, who cast a spell of confidence over the students like a snake charming a bird, men whose phraseology will be the livery of orthodoxy, but the private meaning of which will be the beast of heterodoxy. With satanic deafness and adroitness, They'll slip in a shot of the infectious virus of scholastically glorified infidelity like a boll weevil slightly sting in a tender cotton bowl, which could not be detected until the bowl is nearly grown and the stung quarters found to be rotten. By force of the power of the winsome personality of the professor, the student's discernment is blinded and dull and his loyalty is held to the professor and the institution. The institution will keep men of sound, known soundness at the front to satisfy the credulous but truth-loving common masses this process will continue until the whole deadly leavening is done and the denomination is honeycombed with strong, adroit, deaf personalities in prominent pulpits throughout the denomination and the only cure will be a split. For the denomination as such will have gone the way of spiritual death, substituting for spiritual service a program of material and social improvement of environments, religious recreation, and entertainment under church auspices. T.T. T. Martin wrote me, quote, Muse, that's the completest picture of what's coming that's ever been written. And I'd like to ask you, has that prophecy been fulfilled today? In the very article that I read, nobody could deny it.
We're trying to entertain the people instead of get them saved. We're depending on the ways of the world to reach the world, and we're not reaching the world. The world's in its last stages of decay right now. And people are lost by the millions, religious, join somebody's church, but you couldn't hem them up in a revival service. All right, I'm not through. I got another article. I read it from the paper. It's a big article. This is sad. Oregon, Oregon governor's son, 21, describes his drug addiction in TV interviews. I'm talking about compromising. See, our state's guilty too. They've come to the place where they say there's no hope for a dope addict. Once you get on dope, and so now I'm going to show you what they're going to do about it. This young man, the son of the governor of one of the 48 or 50 states, Oregon's governor, he said, I passed out on the bedroom floor upstairs, he related, and when they came in, they saw the syringe. And that told the story. They knew that I hadn't just fainted, but I'd had a load of dope. And their boy, the governor's son, was laying unconscious on the floor. Now I want to show you what the state's going to do about it, and we're going to face this thing. And remember, you know what Brother Wolf said through the years, there's only one cure, and that's Christ. Amen. There'll never be any other. Young McCall explained how he became an addict, and I've got some respects to pay to a profession here this morning. And it needs to be paid, it needs to be done publicly. Young McCall explained how he became an addict. He said, he tells it, I had an appendectomy with complications. I spent eight months in the hospital. They plugged me with morphine, hard narcotics. I was hooked when I left there. The whole thing snowballed. I went to the street to get what I wanted. And the doctors and the racketeers in the medicine business are going to give an account for making a dope addict out of the governor's son. The doctors are making more dope addicts out of the people and everything else combined in this country today. The drug stores are exactly what they say. They are drug stores. And God's people, unless there's a very rare exception, has no business at all fiddling with drugs. The thing about it, we've gotten away from living by faith. We don't trust God for rest anymore. We trust the drug store for it. We don't trust God for deliverance from anything anymore. And so we're living a life of modernism and infidelity and unbelief. And we're yoked together with the unbelievers. And the question, how did he get the drugs? Why, well, he said, it's easy. Actually, I could get it on this block. And he waved in the direction of the quiet residential neighborhood where the governor lives only four blocks from the state capitol building. No problem at all. Just get them right here in my own block. He said, how'd you get your money? He said, I stole from my parents. He said, I used their credit cards to get things in one store. Then I'd turn the stuff in for cash at another store. There's no doubt but that dope addiction is on us for the final kill shot of a great nation. When, when dope addiction begins to grab our teenagers and when the life stream, the girls, begin to get shot full of dope and when, when, when they begin to become expecting and then realizing what that dope's going to do to that little unborn baby, see, and what it's already done and we've had some experiences along that line now, he begins to criticize the places. He said the first time he was sent to the University of Oregon Medical School, Sam recalls how I talked my way out of there in seven days. I conned my parents into taking me out. Then he recalls the second time I went to the Oregon State Hospital, I was sadly neglected because they have no rehabilitation program. I was put in the maximum security ward for a grueling three months to withdraw from speed. Now I want to read you something else. The governor conceded he is aware of the lack of rehabilitation care for drug users. He said the state is experimenting with several programs now with federal financing. And let me tell you something. The only thing our state and nation, federal and statewide, the only thing they're going to ever do is experiment until they get to Jesus and the Word of God. I don't experiment in anything. I mean, I'm not bragging about it. We don't experiment on dope addicts. We don't experiment on alcoholics. We've got the answer. We tell them what it is, and they receive Jesus Christ, and the victory is there. Amen. We've passed the experimenting stage. I believe it becomes, when, when it becomes a genuine experience, then you don't have to experiment anymore. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this compromising program that we've got going on in our churches and in our state. Why, there's a young man in this service today whose name I'll not call. 
He's been through all of that. They've had him on drugs. He hardly knew his own name. You think he got cured? You think that was the answer? Not at all. He'd been running from God, and when he came to Jesus, and when you want victory, you come to Jesus, and you'll get it. And yet, that's exactly what's happening across and around this world. And I quote in the text again, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Bible said, God forbid that I should do evil, that good may come. And I don't believe it's God's will to compromise or ask the world to help us. I believe that Jesus Christ will do the whole job if we'll put our trust in him. Girls, you're in a place, and men and women in this church, you're in a place to get complete victory. If you want to get saved, you can get saved. If you want to go to heaven, you can go to heaven. And uh, if you want victory, you can have victory in your own life. And if there's any girl or boy or man or woman in this building now that doesn't have victory after this service, it's because you don't want the victory. You'd rather live in sin and in the flesh pots of Egypt's land. The strangers to God, His grace and His love, were gathered by blue Galilee. Thank you for joining us today for the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. You may listen to the preaching and the special music of the Family Altar Program live streaming 24 hours a day when you visit our ministry website, Roloff.org. We love hearing from our listeners. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, please write to us at Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. This broadcast is made possible by the prayers and financial support of listeners like you. Thank you for partnering with us, and remember that Christ is the answer. And they were blessed. He gave the weary rest. He made the blinded eyes to see. He fed the hungry soul, and He made the wounded whole by the waters of blue Galilee. They sat at his feet, and they looked in his face, content in his presence to be, for no one before had cared for their souls like the stranger who sat by the sea.